We are now going to talk about drawing in OpenGL. So far, we've taken a number of steps, understanding the overall framework of OpenGL. We've talked about buffers and matrices. We've talked about callbacks, but we haven't actually drawn anything on the screen yet. We'll correct that in this segment. Let's first talk about the primitives that OpenGL has available for drawing. In old-style OpenGL, there used to be a large number of additional primitives, but many of them have been removed in new OpenGL. We still have points, which are just specified in homogeneous coordinates. Lines, you can also have multiple lines determined by a line strip or a line loop. You have triangles, which is perhaps the most important primitive for drawing. In old OpenGL, there used to be quads, general polygons, and quad strips, which have all been removed in new OpenGL for simplicity. Effectively, we can use triangles and two efficiency improvements for collections of triangles. The triangle strip essentially takes a single triangle and then adds new triangles where you have to specify only one additional vertex at a time. So if you have this triangle specified, the next triangle is just specified by taking one additional vertex and using the previous two vertices. Similarly, the subsequent triangle will just need one additional vertex, one additional vertex, one additional vertex. A triangle fan is similar in the sense that it has one point about which the different triangles effectively form a fan. Again, with one additional vertex, you can specify an entire triangle. To reiterate, the points are GL points stored in homogeneous coordinates, line segments, triangles, which is the most important, GL triangles. You also have strips and fans. More complex primitives used to be available in GLUT, in particular spheres, teapots, and cubes. These must now be converted into triangles. The skeleton code that we are providing you does do this conversion, and we do not use the deprecated glut sphere, glut cubed, or glut teapot commands anymore. We'll now talk about the mechanics of drawing. First, I have a couple of slides on old style OpenGL drawing, which, although it's deprecated, is actually much simpler to understand and can be a first step for you to understand the process. In old-style OpenGL drawing, one could enclose vertices between a pair of GL begin and GL end commands. And within those commands, one could include normal C code and attributes like colors. So it would be very common to specify a color then specify a vertex. There would be commands like GL vertex 3F and GL color 3F. You might be wondering what the 3F stands for. Remember that OpenGL came into being in the early 90s and well before the C++ and object-oriented programming. In fact, OpenGL is written in C. Therefore, in order to have functions that take in different arguments, three floating point numbers versus three integers, or versus four floating point numbers in homogeneous coordinates, instead of overloading the function call, we have different functions which are specified by attributes like 3f, which simply means the input is three floating point numbers. In old style OpenGL, it was also important that the color would be set before the vertex, Therefore, you might have something like GL color 3F to set the color, and then you might have something like GL vertex. This was also done in an assembly line model. So you pass vertices to the server they get transformed, they get shaded within the OpenGL pipeline. Nowadays, of course, you have modern vertex and fragment shaders in the graphics processing unit. In old OpenGL, there was also a concept of immediate mode, wherein you specified triangles, it was immediately sent to the server and drawn. 
Let me just show you one example of old OpenGL drawing, which again, I want to emphasize is not used in your skeleton code or in your homework assignments where you will be using modern OpenGL. So in the display routine, we first clear the color buffer bit and then we draw a polygon with the vertices having appropriate colors, blue, white, red, and green, similar to the polygon I showed you in our program. You begin uh, with the GL polygon. You set the color red, RGB, this is red. You draw a vertex at 0 0.5, 0 0.50. These are all vertices on the plane Z is equal to zero. This is at X is equal to 0.5, Y is equal to 0.5, it's red. Thereafter, you draw another vertex at, uh, with color green at minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Similarly, you draw, set the color to blue, you draw a vertex minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5, set the color to white, you draw a vertex here at 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5. GL end ends the sequence of uh, primitives. This is now sent immediately to the server for drawing. GL flush flushes the set of commands and they are drawn immediately. I talked about clients and servers. In fact, old OpenGL operates on a client-server model, even if the client and server are on the same machine, which is typically the case, wherein the client, which is the user program, generates vertices, the server draws them, even if the server is really running on the same machine as the client. There are a couple of synchronization commands. GL flush forces the client to send network packets for drawing, and GL finish waits for an ACK and is sparingly used for synchronization. In modern OpenGL, all of this has been replaced using the notion of vertex array objects, which we will discuss next. There is a fair warning that this is more complicated but is useful for modularity and efficiency. In modern OpenGL, I specify the floor as follows. So first I have an array of the four vertices of the floor with the three uh, locations in the array for the x, y, and z coordinates. And that's just the same way I specified it earlier, 0 0.5.5, 0, minus 0 0.5.5. It's the same floor we saw earlier in old style OpenGL. But I will also specify an array for colors instead of doing it in immediate mode where the colors are red, green, blue, and white as before. Then there is the specification of indices. Essentially, I, by defining the floor vertices, I put the set of vertices in an array, but I still need to figure out the way of connecting them. In this case, I have my floor, which I can draw like this, and I have connected it in this way, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is vertex 0, minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is vertex 1, minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5 is vertex 2, and 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5 is vertex 3. So when I am looking at the indices and the elements for construction, 0, 1, 2 corresponds to the triangle joining these vertices. Remember that I only have triangles in OpenGL, so I have to connect these. And 0, 2, 3 is correspondingly this triangle. So I've specified the floor with two triangles. That's what these indices correspond to. I also specify the coordinates for my second plane with the same vertices, except that the Z coordinate is now equal to 1. If you look here, the z-coordinates are all 1. And the colors are also different in this case in that all of the colors are red. However, the indices are exactly the same as what we had earlier in order to specify the triangles for the second plane, which is above the first plane. Let's now talk about the representation of vertex array objects. The first line in this code defines the number of objects as 2 corresponding to the two planes. The number of buffers per object is 3, corresponding to vertices, colors, and indices. Thereafter, I use glu-int to define a number of vertex array objects. You will need a vertex array object per object. Then I have the number of buffers, which is the number per object, 
times the number of objects. The objects which will store like object IDs, again, is the number of objects. The primitive types is the type of the object, which is triangles or strips. And finally, the number of elements or the number of triangles or geometric elements for each object. The floor geometry is specified with a vertex array. We'll define an enum for vertices, colors, and elements. It's just we'll set them to 0, 1, and 2. And similarly for floor and floor 2. Below that, in, in the init function, we will create the buffer objects for later use. So GL generate vertex arrays tells OpenGL to generate the number of vertex array objects corresponding to number of objects. This just creates the unique identifiers for the objects. GL gen buffers number per object, which is uh, three in this case times number of objects, generates buffers for vertices, colors, and elements. And finally, we have this delete buffers, which operates like a destructor when a buffer is no longer needed. Let us now talk about the init object command which effectively initializes the objects and initializes the buffers needed for drawing an object. Again, you're given as input the integer ID of the object, okay? and you're given a pointer to the vertex array, the size of the vertex array, pointer to the color array, the size of the color array, a pointer to the array of indices, the size of the indices array, Note that in this case, we just use unsigned characters or bytes for the indices, but of course, if we had more complex objects, we would need to use integers. And then the type, which in this case is triangle. So the offset is just saying for different objects, as you increase the object ID, we will be offset in terms of the buffers by the object number times the number of buffers per object. The first thing you do is bind the vertex array corresponding to the given object, that is the vertex array object of the given object ID. Thereafter, you bind the corresponding buffer, which will be given by offset plus vertices, colors, and elements. You specify the, vert the buffer data. So it's an array buffer, the size of the vertex, size of the vertices, vertex is where it's vert is where it starts. And this is a hint to OpenGL, this is meant for static drawing. We also need to interact with the shader. And within the shader, we will use layout location zero for the vertices. So you enable the vertex attribute array zero so that you can pass this information to the shader. And then there is this GL vertex attrib pointer command. So zero is the layout location. Uh, three says that this is now a vertex array. So each element of the array has x, y, and z, uh, x, y, and z coordinates. Uh, this is an uh, GL float, okay, is the data type here. Uh, false corresponds to the fact of whether the data should be normalized. Here we talk about the stride in the data. So the, what is the difference in bytes between one element of and the other element? And of course, it would be 3 for x, y, z times the size of the float variable. 0 is a pointer to how much you have to offset into the buffer. And in this case, I mean, the information is right at the start, so it's set to 0. Binding the buffer now corresponding to the colors specifying the data for the colors. We use layout location one for the colors. You enable the vertex attribute array one. You similarly set up the vertex attribute pointer for location one. Again, it's just the same way as vertices, the same set of arguments. Binding the buffer for the elements and the indices now, reading in that buffer data. Finally, we set the primitive type for the object to the type that is input and the number of elements for the object to the size of the indices array. Once you have done with this vertex array object, you can unbind it to prevent unwanted modifications later. So you should always, as a best practice, bind zero in order to unbind the current vertex array object.
after we have done all of this setup to initialize the object, drawing of the actual vertex object is surprisingly simple. The draw object command just takes in the integer value corresponding to the object. You bind the vertex array for that object and you draw the elements corresponding with, where you are given the primitive type for the object, the number of elements for that object. GL unsigned byte tells you that the elements are just represented by an unsigned character which is the indices specifying the object. Thereafter you unbind. In the display routine you have this command GL clear, GL color buffer bit which clears all of the pixels. Thereafter you draw the object floor, draw the object floor 2 and you flush and you start processing the buffered OpenGL commands. Finally, I just briefly want to talk about initialization, including initialization of the shaders. We'll talk more about shaders in the next video segment. Notice that you have integer values for the vertex shader, the fragment shader, and the shader program. This is the initialization you do in init for drawing. We already talked about gen vertex arrays and gen buffers to generate unique IDs for the vertex arrays and the buffers. You initialize the object. We looked at the init object command. You init object for the floor. You init object for floor 2. Then you need to do initialization for the shaders. The vertex shader lies in this file, shaders.noop.vertex. Right now it's not doing anything particularly interesting. The initialization for the fragment shader lies in this file, shader.noop.fragment. These do not actually have to be in files. In fact, they are just strings to the OpenGL program that are compiled on the fly. In practice, we read them in from the vertex and frag files that we have created. The next part is creating the shader program, which is initializes a program based on the vertex and fragment shader. I will now demonstrate the program. Here I'm showing you the actual text for the program. You can download this, of course. It is the MyTest sequence of demos, and this is MyTest1.cpp. I can even run the program here. Let me show it to you. This is what you saw earlier. You have these two planes. I can zoom in, I can zoom out, and I can hit escape or quit to quit. What I'm going to do now is try to change the color on floor. So I first comment out these lines. I'm showing you writing of the actual code so you get a sense that this is simple code that can be written and modified. Let me now uncomment these lines and I will change the colors to have the second, the lower floor be all white. I change the all of the colors to be white. There are a number of different compilation options. I am working on a Mac, so I'm just going to compile from the command line. We are given you the make files, so don't worry too much about all of the arguments here. It should just work. Now I'm going to run the program. Notice that it's compiled the shader files for the vertex and the fragment shader and successfully attached and linked the shaders. You notice that now the floor the, at the bottom is white, the floor on top is still red, I didn't change the colors, but instead of being multicolored, the floor at the bottom is still white. Go ahead, download these programs, and explore playing with